This is the first lesson in a series of four lessons on the book of Jonah. <clears throat> I'm recording this lesson um, uh, post uh, class. The next three lessons will are, are actually the live recordings of when I was actually taught. Um, I was asked after the first class to, re to record it, and I hadn't recorded the first class yet, so this one I'm doing after the fact. So um, we'll get started in the book of Jonah tonight. And uh, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it's a help to you. Um, we start our study of the book of Jonah actually in 2 Kings chapter 14. Now, 2 Kings chapter 14 is actually the first mention of the man Jonah. <clears throat> we find it in uh, chapter 14, verse 25. Um, The other mentions of Jonah in the Bible are, of course, in the book of Jonah, but also outside of the book of Jonah, Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, and Luke 11, 29 through 30 and 32. Jonah's name means dove, um, and uh, we're going to look into a little bit more about what we can learn from Jonah out of this first passage in 2 Kings chapter 14. Let's start in verse 23. It says, in the fifteenth year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, began to reign in Samaria, and reigned forty and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He restored the coast of Israel from the entering of Hamath unto the sea of the plain, according to the word of the Lord of Israel, of Lord God of Israel, which he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet, which was of gath -hefer. Um So we find here that, uh, from verse 23 here, that Jonah is contemporary with Amaziah, king of Judah. Uh, he's contemporary uh, with Jeroboam, king of Israel. Uh, Amaziah, king of Judah, is the ninth generation from David, and uh, Jeroboam, king of Israel, if you know the name Jehu, he's the third generation king, uh, from, from Jehu there, who was a king of, uh, of Israel. Now, here, here's the, the testimony of, of Jonah out of this just this short passage that mentions his name. Number one, in verse 25, God calls him his servant. He spake by the hand of his servant, Jonah. Now, um, if you know anything about Jonah, you most uh, obviously, most likely know the negative that is associated with Jonah. But um, here... But by God calling Jonah his servant, he places him in some pretty good company. Um, consider this. The following names I'm going to read are all uh, called servants of God. Um, so listen to these names that, that uh, Jonah is associated with be, by being a servant of God. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Caleb, David, Job, Isaiah, Nebuchadnezzar, Zerubbabel, Daniel, James, Paul, and Christ were all called servants of God. Now that's a that's a pretty good crowd to be to be associated with. Um, Jonah gets a bad rap, of course, for his disobedience to God, but he is called a servant of God, and he is associated with some very good men in the Bible, being a servant of God, someone that God could count on, someone that God uh, used, his servant. So God calls him his servant. That's his testimony out of uh, 2 Kings chapter 14. Um, his vocation. He was a prophet. The Bible says he spake by the hand of his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet. Now, um, he is a true prophet, um, as indicated by the fact that in verse 25 that uh, this prophecy was fulfilled, um, the restoring of the coast of Israel, which God spake by the hand of his servant Jonah. Uh, so he's a true prophet, um, and later on in the book of Jonah, we see that that is also, again, uh, revealed that what he says comes to pass. We know that the Bible says a, a, a prophet has to be 100% correct. Um, not one, if, it, if what he says doesn't come to pass, then he's not a true prophet. He's to be stoned. So um, Jonah is a true prophet. He's a true prophet of, of, of God. And that fact is further confirmed by Jesus Christ himself calling um, Jonah a prophet. And we're going to see that in the passages in Matthew and Luke. Now, what's his lineage? Um, 
his testimony that he's, is that he's God's servant. His vocation is that he's a prophet, a true prophet. And his lineage is that he's the son of Amittai. Uh, Amittai uh, means true. And so we saw Jonah, the word, the name Jonah means dove. So we have here, what we have here is Jonah, a dove, which is a type of the Holy Ghost. And he's a son of truth, uh, which is very interesting when you put that, that concept together. You have um, a book of the Bible that uh, most modern people doubt the narrative of. They don't believe what is written in the book of Jonah. Uh, the whole concept, uh, the whole uh, the story of the whale and everything is, is doubted by most people, even uh, so-called Christians. But if we take the name of Jonah and the name of his father, a dove, we have a type of the Holy Spirit telling truth. <laughs> and that's what the book of Jonah is. It's, it's, it's a, a Holy Ghost-inspired book of the Bible. And it is true. Now, so his, uh, his father was Amittai. Uh, his home. Um, is gath Hefer. We see that uh, in verse 25, which was of gath Hefer. The location of gath Hefer is uh, southwest of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and is actually in, in Galilee. Now this is pretty significant because of a particular passage in J John chapter 7. If you look at John chapter 7, <clears throat> there's an interesting statement made by the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees had just sent men to uh, uh, go take Christ, catch him in his words, and bring him back to them. And we read, uh, we pick up the narrative in verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? And look what the Pharisees say here to him. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. Now, I know what they're saying. Um, they're basically saying that there's no prophecy of the Messiah coming out of, out of Galilee. But the fact that they say out of Galilee ariseth no prophet, well, then they're dead wrong. Because Jonah is out of Galilee. And it's very interesting, because Jonah is a type of Christ, as we'll see in this book. So it's interesting that they're ignorant of this fact that Jonah's from Galilee and he happens to be a type of Christ. They also reject, in their mind, reject Jonah, a prophet from Galilee. They reject Christ as well. Um, so Jonah being a type of Christ, that kind of that lines up there. But Jonah is out of gath Hefer, which is in Galilee. <clears throat> now let's turn to the other passage that um, Manson mentions uh, uh, Jonah. Matthew chapter 12. And look in verse 38. Starting in verse 38, Matthew 12, 38 says this, Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Which is very interesting because uh, if you look over in Luke chapter 2, um, Jesus Christ is the sign. I'll read that really quick. I just want to read that really quick. Um, because it kind of goes... In context here, Matthew two thirty four says this: when when uh, Jesus Christ is being brought into the temple um, as a baby, and um, uh, it says here, and Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken again. So the child is a sign. Jesus Christ was a sign. And there, the, here the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38, are coming up to Christ saying, we would see a sign of thee. Well, the problem is that they've already rejected the first sign. Um, and that's going to be very important to see why Christ says what he says to them here. Um, they've already rejected the first sign. They've rejected Jesus Christ. They re rejected the signs, the miracles that he's shown them as signs. And they rejected what he said of himself. So they say, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 
the men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So, according to this passage, Jonas, or Jonah, is the, it's the only, he's the only sign given to an evil and adulterous generation. Um, <clears throat> the Bible says that an evil, adulterous generation seeks a sign. This is reconfirmed later in Matthew 16 in the other passage he mentioned Jonah in. And, uh, like I said, they've already rejected the sign that's standing right in front of them. So, um, they're seeking for a sign of their own choosing. They don't want a sign that God sent to them, Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ tells them, you've rejected me. The only sign you're going to be given is the sign of the prophet Jonah, who is a type of Jesus Christ, by the way. But um, now what's the sign? Here's the sign uh, uh, that Christ gives them. Verse 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, number one that we see of this is... Um, Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly. Jesus Christ confirms the narrative of Jonah, of the book of Jonah. Christ states the fact of him being in the whale's belly. as just, It's just a matter of fact. Um, and then he says this, that here's the sign that so shall, as Jonah was in the whale's belly three, three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So uh, we see this uh, passage immediately shows us that Jonah is a type of Christ. And we'll talk about this uh, much more extensively in chapter 2 when we get to that chapter. Now, the other passage that is, uh, mentions Jonah, Matthew 16, we already alluded to it once. And it's uh, just kind of a reiteration of what Christ said in Matthew 12. Matthew 16, 4 says, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. So just a reiteration kind of of what he said to them in Matthew 12. Now, look over at Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. And this is the last uh, mention of Jonah in the Bible. Um, and let's, let's read the passage so we can see what the Bible says about it. Um, some of it is a reiteration of Matthew 12, just a restatement of the, what happened there. But Luke chapter 11, verse 29 says this, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. And there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. And then he looked down at verse 32. It says, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. So we see a few things extra in this passage. One of them is that the, um, the fact that Jonah is a sign to the Ninevites as well. In verse 30 says that Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites. Um, and we'll see some other things that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, make mention of later in, in the book of Jonah. But Jonah is also assigned not only to this generation, but he's also assigned to the Ninevites. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we go through this book of Jonah, um, some of the topics and themes that we'll see in, uh, in this book that we'll talk about and um, make application of is uh, avoiding the call of God, the consequences of sin and disobedience. We're going to see some things about the heathen and, and some of their, their understanding and, and uh, uh, behavior. Uh, we're going to see Jonah as a type of the first Adam. And we're also going to see Jonah, as we've already mentioned, as a type of the last Adam, Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about the uh, topic of hell. We'll talk about God's mercy. And we'll talk about uh, a little bit about the topic of lukewarm, lukewarm Christians as well. Um, this, this format of this, this lesson is pretty much verse by verse. The book is short enough that it allows us to do that within the, the four lessons. So we'll do by verse by verse, and we're going to deal with, as much as we can, the historical, the doctrinal, and the practical aspects of each, each verse, as, as the Lord permits us to do so, and as the passages and the scriptures allow. You know that, that every passage of scripture can be uh, um, uh, interpreted or, or uh, viewed in, in, in three ways. It can be viewed as the historical context, something that this actually happened in history. It was a, an actual account of something that happened. We, we, we understand the historical context of these verses. We'll also look at the doctrinal context and, and um, of these verses. The, in other words, what is, what is taught to us, what truth is taught to us by these verses, and the practical aspects, last of all, which is how can we apply these things 
to our lives. The practical aspects are, are, are many. Of You can take many practical aspects of a single verse, uh, but we were looking at, as much as we can, those three uh, contexts of each verse. And we'll also see that each chapter has a kind of a theme that, that we'll expound upon as well. So, um, without further ado, let's get into uh, the book of Jonah. We'll turn to Jonah. And, of course, pick it up in chapter 1. <clears throat> the topics in the chapter 1 of the book of Jonah as we already mentioned some of them, avoiding the call of God, the consequences of disobedience, disobedience the heathen, um, and uh, Jonah, a type of the first Adam. So let's pick it up in verse, uh, we'll start with verse 1 and read down to verse 5, and then we'll talk and give some, uh, actually, we'll read down to verse 3, actually, first of all. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish, Tarshish, and he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it, to go with him unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Uh, so number one, verse one says that Jonah is the son of Amittai. It gives our link back to Second Kings 14, confirming that this is the same Jonah we're talking about. Both of them refer to him as the son of Amittai. So we know that uh, Second Kings 14 is the Jonah of the book of Jonah. And number two, we see that it's the word of the Lord that comes unto Jonah. So this is a direct command, a direct revelation to Jonah from God about what God is wants him to do. And the call, what he wants him to do, comes in verse 2. It's, uh, Arise, go to Nineveh, and cry against it, that great city, and cry against it, for the wickedness has come up, from before, uh, up before me. Now, this, this, this is not a call uh, of God, I mean, not a message of vindictiveness. Um, I believe this is a, a, a warning in mercy to the, the city of Nineveh. Now, before I go any farther into that, um, let me just say Nineveh, its location is in a modern-day city or very near a modern-day city called Mosul. I'm sure you're very familiar with that, with the events of, of the day. This t it's in uh, northern Iraq. Um, it was probably the capital city of Assyria. We see in Second Kings chapter 19 um, that uh, the king of Assyria returns back to the city of, of Nineveh after um, uh, the, the defeat from the angel of God smiting the armies there. Uh, Genesis chapter 10, uh, you can, if you want to look at that, Genesis chapter 10 tells us it was built by Asher. Um, and that was its origin. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 10, verse uh, 11 says this, Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kela. So uh, that city was built by Asher, and that's where, you, where we get the name Assyria out of that name Asher. Um, so this is, the, uh, this is associated with the kingdom of Assyria. Now, uh, God says that their wickedness is come up before me. Now, there's something about um, gross, violent wickedness that, I guess, flies in the face of God, that brings special attention to God. Um, look over this. This is not the only time this happens. Look over at Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18 says a similar thing. about another city. Genesis 18, verse 20 says, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, the cry of it is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. So, uh, God says about the cry of this city, the, the wickedness that's associated with Sodom and Gomorrah, it's coming up before God. I don't, I don't believe for a minute that the, he's talking about the people in Sodom and Gomorrah crying unto God. It's the, the wickedness and the, the debauchery of what's going on in that city is, is come up to God's attention in, in a special way more than any just uh, regular sin does, I guess. Um, 
it flies in the face of God. So you, you see that that same term, you know, it says the the their wickedness is come up come up before me about Nineveh, and it says uh, about Sodom and Gomorrah the cry of it which is come unto me. There's another passage kind of like this too, far, farther back in Genesis, Genesis chapter four. Um, you know the story of Cain and Abel. Cain uh, is envious at his brother because God accepted his sacrifice, which was a blood sacrifice, as he ought to have brought. And Cain didn't, uh, he brought the fruit of the ground, the vegetables and everything, and God didn't accept that. And uh, God gives Cain a chance to repent. He does not, and he kills his brother, Abel. And in verse uh, 9, chapter 4, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not, am I my brother's keeper? God says this, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So something about uh, about that uh, uh, exceptional wickedness comes up and flies in the face of God and grabs uh, get him, his attention more so than just uh, the everyday sin that goes on uh, in, 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 with mankind. But in any case, uh, God says in verse 2 of Jonah chapter 1 that... Their wickedness has come up before me. So basically, God's limit has about been reached with this city. He's about done with the kind of wickedness that's going on here. And uh, he's preaching a warning against it. Now, here's a question. Why in the world is God concerning himself with a heathen Gentile nation? Um, at this point in time, we're in the Old Testament. God is dealing with nations, but he's dealing with the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Um, why is he bothering to send a message to uh, a Gentile nation? Well, here's a couple of thoughts to think about. Um, two books after Jonah, the book of Nahum, which actually happens to be again to the people of Nineveh, interestingly enough. Um, Nahum chapter 1, verse 3 says this, The Lord is slow to anger. And uh, he is. He is slow to anger. Look also at First Peter. First Peter chapter uh, 3. That's not First Peter, that's Second Peter. Excuse me. I misread that. Second Peter chapter 3. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now the Lord says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now look also at this passage, Ezekiel, chapter 33. say, well, that passage in First Peter is in the New Testament. You know, that's after uh, Jesus Christ has died for our sins and been buried and resurrected again. Well, look at Ezekiel 33, verse 11. God says this, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? And yet God is telling uh, a heathen nation here, He's going to give he's going to give warning to a heathen nation, um, and I believe it's because God is slow to anger; He is uh, not willing that any should perish. And he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Um, he gives space for people to repent, and um, though He's about had it with Nineveh, He is going to give them their opportunity to repent. Now. Um, I believe God gives everybody space to repent. Um, I don't believe he just cuts anybody off without the opportunity of God dealing with them over and over again. No one's going to come up to God and say, you didn't give me any chances. God gave, gives people second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth chances. No one's going to point their finger in God's face and say that you did not give me a chance uh, to turn, to repent, to get, get right with you. Uh, over in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, <clears throat> we see... Um, God's promise to Abraham about how he was going to inherit the land, but he was going to have to wait um, 
a little bit of time. And he makes the prophecy in verse 13 that uh, his people were going to be a stranger in a land that's not theirs and, and they were going to be afflicted 400 years. You know that uh, um, God is giving this prophecy way in advance, but why why wait 400 years? It's actually 430 years from when uh, um, uh, they're actually in Egypt and plus the time that um, between Abraham and when they actually go down to Egypt. A good amount of time going on there. Why is God waiting so long? Look at verse um, 16 of Genesis 15. It says this, But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Um, what he's doing is he's, he's uh, the, the Amorites are wicked, they're, they're heathen, but he's waiting before he sends Israel in there to wipe out the, the Amorites and the Canaanites and all the rest of them because God is giving them space to repent. He says their iniquity is not yet full. He hasn't uh, come to the point where he uh, has dealt with them and, and uh, they haven't repented. He's dealt with them and they haven't repented. He's going to uh, give them space to repent. Everybody gets space to repent. You think that that's not dramatic enough, uh, the heathen nations getting space to repent. Look over at Revelation chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> he's talking to the church of Thyatira here. And uh, one of the things he mentions about that he has against them is in verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophet, is to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, if you were to call out the most wicked woman in the Bible, um, I'm sure someone would bring up the name of Jezebel. But look at verse 21 of Revelation chapter 2. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. But God gave her space to repent of her fornication, even Jezebel, God gives an opportunity, some time, uh, to repent. So I believe God has given space to the Ninevites to repent. They are just about, their iniquity is just about full. And God, in His mercy, in His grace, in His long-suffering, and His unwillingness to see the wicked perish, sends, well, attempts to send Jonah, uh, gives him this message to go up to Nineveh, because uh, God is giving them space to repent. Now, verse 3 the most well-known part of the book of Jonah, Jonah's disobedience. Now, here it says, and Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish. Now, um, this is Jonah's disobedience, and this is one, uh, one of the first ways he's a type of, of Adam. Uh, Romans 5.19a says, by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. And this is Jonah's disobedience. Um, uh, he's just like Adam there, fleeing, fleeing from God. <clears throat> we'll see that in a second. Uh, just a side note, Tarshish is um, a very debated location, but um, it's possibly, it seems to be possibly in Spain, which would be the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. Nineveh's to Jonah's east, and uh, Spain is in the west for Jonah. So he flees, and he flees unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Uh, and here again, as I mentioned previously, this is... Uh, just what Adam did. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says, Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah disobeys God, just like Adam disobeyed God, and he flees from the presence of the Lord, tries to get away from that presence of God, just like Adam and Eve did. Another way he's like Adam there. Now this is an incredible thing because of what we know about God um, in, Genesis, uh, in the Psalm, excuse me, Psalm chapter 139. You look over in Psalm 139, starting in verse 7, it says this, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? That's exactly what Jonah was trying to do. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Now think about this. <clears throat> Jonah's flight from God, from the presence of God, was first into a ship. And we read later that he went down into the hold of the ship, which would have been dark. Well, David says here in Psalm 139, verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Um, so God sees him in the dark. He says, uh, where does Jonah end up 
after he's in the hold of the ship. He gets thrown into the sea. He's in the belly of the whale. And David says in 139.9, If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And then uh, we'll see later on as we talk about this in chapter 2 that Jonah ends up in hell. And David says in Psalm 139, verse 8, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So there is no way to get away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's, it's kind of ludicrous to think that Jonah would try to flee from, from a God who could be everywhere and is everywhere. Um, but yet we, we, we do the same thing in our minds sometimes when we, when we do what we want, when we sin, we disobey God. We, we are obviously, for the moment, thinking that God doesn't see or He doesn't care, whatever the case may be, but um, we are not getting away from the presence of the Lord, and neither is Jonah. <clears throat> now, Jonah went down to Joppa, and we're going to see um, a series of descent of Jonah, where he goes down, 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 down. And this is the first one. He went down to Joppa. Joppa is southwest of Galilee. Um, which, which which would have been where Jonah was from, southwest of Galilee, and it's uh, kind of a west northwest direction from Jerusalem. If you're any idea where Jerusalem is on the map of Israel, um, it may be known as the Jaffa today or Jaffa. Um, possibly that's the same uh, uh, location as Joppa. Now, just let me say something about this 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 term down. Um, when when you see the word down in the Bible. It's uh, it's often referring to to elevation, not to a compass direction. We 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 say a lot of times, I'm going down south. I'm gonna go down south or down there in the sense of we're going from north to south. Um, uh, but um, in the Bible, just as a help for you to understand your Bible a little better, when the Bible says down, it's often referring from going from a place of higher elevation to lower elevation. Um, for instance, a lot of times people will talk about going up to Jerusalem, and that's because Jerusalem was up on a mountain. Um, so they very often go up to Jerusalem, no matter which compass direction they were coming from. But we will truly see that Jonah descended down, 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 down. Now it says in verse 3 that he paid the fare thereof, of that ship. You know what uh, sin has? It has wages. And you have to pay those wages. You have to pay for sin. If you don't get it taken care of by the blood of Jesus Christ. So Jonah pays the fare the wages of uh, of his sin of disobedience to get out of the presence of the Lord. So another way, he's like uh, the first Adam. He's got to pay that wages to get onto that ship. Now, here's a question. Why in the world did Jonah flee? I've, um, I've heard before that uh, it's because uh, well, the Assyrians were so cruel to the Hebrews, and uh, Jonah just hated them because of that. Um, I don't see any indication in the scripture that the Assyrians really had much dealing with uh, Israel until uh, much after Jonah's call. The other statement is that, well, it's just they just uh, disdained, just like the, the, the Gentiles. Uh, you know, they were trying to, he was trying to be, uh, you know, separate. He didn't, didn't want to be associated with the Gentiles. Um, that doesn't seem likely since he shipped out with a bunch of Gentiles. Uh, when he goes down into this ship, he's just shipping out with a bunch of Gentiles. We'll see later, they're all calling upon their own gods. So, um, is it simply because Jonah didn't like uh, Gentiles that he didn't, didn't want to obey God's call? Um, I, I don't believe so. Um, there were other prophets that were called to go preach to the Gentiles. Um, I believe it's Ezekiel in particular um, told to preach, um, or excuse me, Isaiah told <clears throat> to preach to several different countries outside of of um, Israel, Egypt, and uh, other countries, um, Edom that uh, he was supposed to preach to, and he obeyed the call. So there's no. Uh, qualms about other prophets going to preach to, to the Gentiles. So what is Jonah's problem here? What, what is the deal here? Is he just trying to evade his responsibility? Um, he just doesn't want the responsibility of having to, to, to preach uh, to um, a bunch of people? Well, consider this. Um, three chapters after the first mention of Jonah, uh, 
in First Kings and Second Kings uh, fourteen. We see in Second Kings seventeen that Assyria, which is Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, carries away all of Israel, and it's for judgment upon the sin of Israel, uh, for judgment upon their sin. Now Jonah knows he must know the state of his nation. In fact, in the very same passage we read in Second uh, Kings fourteen, it said that the the king there did evil in the sight of the Lord. Um, so Jonah knows the state of his nation. He knows um, that they're away from God, and and um, he's a prophet. He 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 knows uh, a little bit of God's mind, I would say. And I believe he knows that obeying God's call to preach to Nineveh, and because God is long suffering, not willing that they should perish, there's a good chance that these people are going to repent. And if they do, God is going to preserve this nation of Assyria. And uh, that's going to preserve them to be able to execute the judgment of God upon Israel. That will be coming up, uh, as we see in the next three chapters of Second Kings. Um, so my question is, is this an attempt by Jonah to forestall or prevent the judgment of God that's coming on Israel by this nation of Assyria? Now, uh, if you look at chapter 4, verse 3 uh, of Jonah, that statement Jonah makes there, uh, makes much more sense in light of, of this possibility. Jonah says in chapter 4, verse 3, Now there, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. He, and that's after the people of, of Nineveh repent. Why is it better for him to die if the people repented? Well, because they're going to be used to execute judgment upon Israel before the, Israel's sin. They're going to use a Gentile nation to execute judgment upon them. And if, if they survive... If Jonah just lets them go on in their wickedness, God has to judge them, and uh, perhaps it will forestall the judgment of God upon Israel. But that's a possibility. Um, I'm not going to preach it as gospel, but it's it's just possible that Jonah is trying to forestall the coming judgment of God by the nation of Assyria. Now, verse 4, and we'll read verse 4 and 5 and finish up there today. But the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners were afraid, and cried every man unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and he lay and was fast asleep. So verse 4, God prepares a storm. Um, there's a lot of things prepared in this in this um, book, and actually um, something specifically that God says he prepared. It doesn't say that word prepared in verse 4. I kind of wish it did. But um, God makes a, gets a storm whipped up. It's a, a great wind, a mighty tempest, and it's very similar to what we read in the book of Acts, chapter 27, verse 14, the storm Eurocled in a, a, a great wind there. And uh, it does seem, um, with, with those storms being similar, Eurocled was in the Mediterranean Ocean, Mediterranean Sea. Um, um, so Jonah's likely in the Mediterranean Sea, and he's headed towards Tarshish, which is probably... Um, over in Spain, being west of Israel, so that kind of points to that again. Now, this this storm being prepared by the Lord had a purpose. Um, we see the storm here um, had a purpose of getting Jonah back into the will of God. Um, the storm in Acts chapter twenty seven um, was was a purpose for Paul to get him. Uh, at least one purpose was to get him to stop that stop at Melita they have when the ship uh, wrecks, and there was. Um, some some evangelistic work he got done there in the in, in that island of Melita, and God had a purpose for that storm as well. But this case is getting uh, God's servant Jonah uh, back and right right with God. Now, the, a very basic message uh, lesson we learn from this verse is that sin brings trouble. It just always brings trouble, and if we could learn that sin is not worth the short season of pleasure it may bring because in the end it's always the fruit of it is always always trouble always problems and that's what Jonah is reaping here right now um, Jonah has disobeyed God and now he has trouble now verse 5 we see the mariners here they start crying every man unto his God you know you know one guy's got his prayer beads out prayer beads out and saying his prayers the other guy's got his rug pointed out towards Mecca and uh, someone else has uh, got their little Buddha statue that they're rubbing the belly of, whatever the case may be. But these guys are all crying unto their gods. Don't make the mistake of of believing that religion brings people closer to God. The heathen are very, very religious, um, because that's that's their attempt in their pride or their vanity or in just their 
lack of understanding, uh, getting closer to God. They're very religious. So there's no lack of re uh, religiosity with, with the heathen. Uh, but the funny thing is, is that their, their, their gods require <laughs> their help. Um, you notice that they cry into his God and then they start casting out the wares and the trying to lighten the ship. See, their, their God needs some, some, some help. Um, he needs their help. Um, basically because they don't really believe that their gods have very much power at all. Um, we, we see uh, in verse, verse 10, <clears throat> um, you see in verse 5 it says the mariners were afraid. But in verse 10, when they finally realize the God that Jonah uh, serves, they are uh, exceedingly afraid. Um, very afraid. So, um, they know their gods uh, uh, don't have much power, if any power at all. Um, and see, the problem is men don't need religion. They need to know the God of the Bible. And we see that the uh, these, these mariners, these heathen in the boat here, uh, once they get to know who the God of the Bible is, who the God of Jonah is, and uh, see his power and his judgment, um, that's when they start getting things right. Not uh, not just because they have a religious system or anything like that. Now, Jonah, in the meantime, while these men are crying out to their gods and trying to help their gods out by, by lightening the ship, Jonah's down there in the, the belly of the ship uh, sleeping. And we notice this, it says Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship. So this is the second down. Jonah has gone down to Joppa, and now he's gone down into a into a ship. Now, uh, <clears throat> if you look at Romans chapter 13, the Bible says this, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. But it says here that it is high time to awake out of sleep. The problem here with Jonah is that he has fallen asleep in the, the midst of that ship there. And the farther from God we get, the easier it is to uh, spiritually fall asleep. When you're, when you're asleep, you're uncircumspect, you're unaware. You're, you're, not, uh, you're apathetic of what's going on around you. You have no uh, awareness of that. And the same is, goes for uh, a spiritual situation of someone who is who has gotten away from the Lord and are is getting sleepy spiritually. They are not aware of being circumspect of what's going on around them. They're going to be susceptible to temptations and giving into those temptations. They're unaware of, of of what's spiritually happening around them. They're apathetic about what's spiritually happening around them. It doesn't really interest them or, or concern them. Um, they don't really care about the will of God as Jonah here has, has uh, disdained the will of God. Um, but the Bible says to uh, cast off the work of darkness works of darkness. So Jonah needs to get out of this ship. He ought to get out of this ship and get the right things right with God. And uh, someone who's asleep uh, needs to, to wake up and cast off the works of darkness, cast, get off out of the darkness, which that, that hold of the ship that Jonah's in would have been dark, a good type of that. And they need to get into Christ if they're not in Christ already. And they need to have Christ get in on them uh, and, and uh, wake up and start to, start doing what they ought to do. Um, now it's funny, sleep is a, is a picture in the Bible, of death. Uh, John chapter 11, uh, when Jesus talks about Lazarus, when Lazarus was sick unto death, and uh, he actually did die, Jesus said that he, our friend Lazarus, sleepeth. And when the disciples didn't understand what he meant, he said, Lazarus is dead, plainly. Um, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul talks about, I would not have, not have you ignorant about them that sleep, but those that are dead in Christ, the dead in Christ, he mentions later on. So sleep is a type of, uh, a type of death. Now, here in Jonah is asleep inside the ship, and what he ends up is is dead inside the fish. And we'll we'll talk about that in uh, in, in chapter two. But um, Jonah gets sleepy, gets careless, getting away from the Lord uh, gets him uh, uncircumspect, unaware, and uh, instead of uh, realizing it was high time to awake, he uh, falls asleep in the ship, and what he ends up is is dead. And this is a pattern I see in Scripture. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, carelessness, or, or if we want to say sleep, as it were, uh, leads to death. And the only solution from that point is a miracle of God to resurrect you. Think about this. So Jonah falls asleep in that ship and ends up, uh, he's uncircumspect, he's unaware of what's going on around him, uh, he's away from the will of God, and he ends up dead inside the fish. We'll show that uh, later on. But um, it's not until God intervenes in Genesis, I mean Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, that he, Jonah is resurrected out of that whale and uh, comes back to life. Uh, think about this story of Eutychus in Acts chapter 20, verses 9 through 12. He falls asleep during Paul's preaching. Paul was long preaching and went on until midnight there. He falls asleep, becomes careless, and what happens? He falls out that window and he dies. And through a miracle, uh, the Apostle Paul resurrects him. Now here's the application. Uh, this has happened already uh, with Adam. And Jonah is a type of Adam, the lost man. Adam disregarded God's will. He disobeyed God. We can call that getting uh, falling asleep there and, and becoming uncircumspect. And what happens to Adam, he ends up dead in trespasses and sins. And it takes a miraculous uh, work of God, but God comes along and offers man the opportunity to be born again. But it's by a miracle of God. Man gets careless, runs away from God, falls asleep, and ends up dead in trespasses and sins, and God has to make him born again if he's ever going to uh, live again. Now, for the Christian, a Christian can become uh, unconcerned, unmotivated, uncircumspect. They get sleepy. Um, and what happens? They become dead. Now, the Christian isn't going to lose their salvation. The Christian isn't going to be... Uh, 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 Away, uh, you know, uh, have a lost salvation there. But we we read in uh, Revelation chapter three about a church that had a name that they lived, but were dead. Um, so we can become dead. We can have dead works. We can have a dead testimony. Um, and what needs to happen? We need a work of God, a miracle, um, to be revived. I know revival oftentimes is is most often mentioned concerning uh, uh, the nation of Israel. And not necessarily is uh, applicable to a Christian because they are alive in Christ. But it, as far as a practical sense of the fact that a Christian gets sleepy, gets uh, gets lazy, and uh, backslides, as it were, and uh, ends up with a dead life, nothing to show for Christ, um, what they need is a revival. Like Jonah is going to be revived after he dies in the whale. Um, like uh, a son of Adam who is dead in trespasses and sins, needs to be revived by being born again. And it all, it call, it all comes about, though, by someone getting away from God and falling asleep, um, getting, getting uh, uncircumspect and careless. Uh, so, so Jonah here, is, uh, he's made some bad choices. His sin has caused him trouble. He has gone down twice now, and he's going to go down three more times. And he is asleep there inside that ship. And so the next lesson, we'll pick it up there in verse, in verse 6 and continue on to finish up chapter 1 and talk about what happened with these heathen and uh, the consequences that Jonah further faces because of his disobedience to God.